Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Lars Chitka, author of The Mind of a Bee, published by the Princeton University Press uh, uh, of Princeton and Oxford, and released July 26. Professor Chitka is a full professor at Queen Mary University of London, where he founded the Research Center for Psychology and was its scientific director. He's carried out extensive work on the behavior, cognition, and ecology of bumblebees and honeybees in their interactions with flowers. His discoveries have made a substantial impact on the understanding of animal intelligence and its neural computational underpinnings. I suggest that you take a look at some of his YouTube videos, which um, are more of a primer and will give you additional understanding of what we'll be talking about today. We take bees for granted, don't we? And like so many things we take for granted, we will not miss them until they're gone. Be that as it may, no pun intended, what is the mind of a bee? For matter, what is a mind anyway? For an insect with the brain of a, the size of a pinhead, the bee does pretty well for itself. It travels on its own over vast distances, it shops, it navigates, it spatially recognizes its entire universe, which is basically ours as well. And it does all this in a hurry in the lifespan of three weeks or so. It spends the day packing sweets into its belly, goes back home, links hands with its mates and gyrates a sort of waltz that gives its buddies an exact location of those best flowers. It dances better than we ever could. And in that dance conveys more information than some people I know in a lifetime. All in all, the bee is a very special neighbor and helper to us, and we need to recognize and protect that relationship. But the most important question I have, and I assume Professor Chitka gets it all the time, does the bee actually have a mind? For that is the title of this book. Welcome, Dr. Chitka, and thanks so much for joining us today. All right, good to meet. Um, well, your title does beg the question, and it is, uh, what is a mind and does a bee have one? And if you'll indulge me, the Britannic definition, the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world and their experiences to think and to feel the faculty of consciousness and thought, or the mind has three basic functions, thinking, feeling, and wanting. Those three functions, thoughts, feelings, and desires can be guided or directed either by one's native egocentrism or by one's potential rational capacities. So if you agree with those definitions, are you really saying that the bee possesses all of those qualities after your decades of research? It looks at least likely at this stage. So the question is a difficult one in the same way as it's difficult to diagnose when a computer or an artificial intelligence system has become sentient. There are no universally accepted criteria for stating that something does or does not have a mind. But we can deconstruct this question, of course, as you have, in to individual components. For example, is there evidence for some form of thinking or feeling, or as you say, wanting um, in an organism, and then take that step by step. And so we have to contrast, I think, an animal, an organism with the mind with some alternative. The alternative is the kind of brain in which it's permanently dark, in which there is no thinking in which there is no possibility to flexibly retrieve autobiographic memories, in which there's no possibility to look forward and plan, in which there is no representation of the world that surrounds an animal. 
And are there really none of these things in bees? And so I think that for all of these parts of a mind, for thinking, for feelings, and for wanting, there are now lines of evidence that are at least strongly suggestive that these exist in bees and other animals, and I'm happy to talk you through them one by one. It reminds me of uh, The Once and Future King um, by T.H. White, where uh, Merlin allows uh, Arthur to possess the, to become a fish or a badger or otter uh, or a bird. And one of the things that's fascinating about your book, as a bookseller, I'm always concerned with covers and epigraphs because that's why people buy books, uh, whether you like it or not. And that's why publishers do good covers. Um, oh, do you have the book with you? Can you show the cover? It's a very simple yeah. cover. It's difficult with that background, but I can, well, yeah, you can see it. Um, hold it up a little higher so we can see the picture, the photo. Is that a photograph? That, that is, is a, photograph. a photo of a euglossine bee. Mm -hmm. So it's a tropical bee. So the epigraph of sorts, because it's contained in the introduction, um, is one that's uh, from Maurice Maeterlinck back in 1901, who really wasn't a scientist. He was a dramatist and wrote plays and things like that and won the Nobel Prize. But normally I wouldn't ask, if you have it, I wouldn't ask someone to read it, but the epigraph is so good. Would you mind reading it in its entirety? Uh, I can certainly do that, yeah. I think it's worthwhile doing. Uh -huh. It's a good idea. Let us suppose that an inhabitant of Venus or Mars were to contemplate us from the height of a mountain and watch the little black specks that we form in space as we come and go in the streets and squares of our towns. All he could do, like ourselves when we gaze at the hive, would be to take some notes to take note of some facts that seem very surprising, and from these facts to deduce conclusions probably no less erroneous, no less uncertain than those that we choose to form concerning the bee. Whither do they tend, and what is it they do, he would ask, after years and centuries of patient watching? What is the aim of their life or its pivot? I can see nothing that governs their actions. The little things that one day they appear to collect and build up the next they destroy and scatter. They come and they go, they meet and disperse, but one knows not what it is they seek. And the thing is, I, I vaguely have thought of that concept over my lifetime, but that really crystallizes it. And I recognize that there is no way you could understand the buildings of a building and the demolition of a building, the wars that we have, it would just look like random motions unless you could somehow, um, like Dr. Feynman says, you know, look at a chess game and feel that you understood it until one day someone castles and you go, wait a minute, what the hell is that? We've never seen that before. And then that made me think of how you actually say, we don't have to go to interstellar space to meet an alien. We have one right here. And that was kind of a taking off point for you. And it really made me think about it because when I listen to your lectures and you talk about a brain the size of a pinhead, but then you go on to say that they're smart, they have personalities, they, they recognize human faces, they have emotions. Um, I never would have thought of that, but I guess, and in your lectures again too, you, you go through those. Most importantly, I guess the one that separates artificial intelligence at this point would be actual consciousness, awareness of its own existence. Mm -hmm. And as you might know, there are some people claiming that artificial intelligence has some form of consciousness at this stage, but let's stick with the bee's mind for, for the time being, because that of course forms the center of this book. So what, what prompts me to diagnose the, the bees as having a mind. So we had already known when I first started researching bees that they are good at learning some things, that for example, they need to 
have very good spatial memory because they need to remember where their home is, their hive in the case of honeybees or their nest in the case of wild bees. If they don't remember that, then they're lost, of course. They they're, they're might well die themselves because they can't live without the social context. But even if they survive as individuals, their, their offspring might be lost or their efforts for the offspring might be in vain. So they have to have a very good spatial memory. They also have to be able to remember flowers. So they have to be, in a sense, careful shoppers in what I call the flower supermarket. They have to explore what's in their flight range. That might be two, three dozen different flower species, all differing in colors and patterns and scents, and the rewards. So that's the quality of the product. How much nectar and pollen is there inside the flowers? And once a bee has tried a few and figured out which ones are the best, then she has to remember the signals that advertise these, these rewards. And we already knew that bees are good at all of these things, but that in a sense does not require thinking. It's a form of associative learning to link, let's say a color with a reward or the, the appearance of the hive with the reward of, of getting home. But over the years, we and other teams have discovered increasingly impressive intelligent behaviors. So we found, for example, that bees can count landmarks in an experiment where we trained them along, along a series of identical tetrahedral tents. They were basically pyramid shaped and the bees had to count, they had to learn to land after the third landmark and then to test whether indeed they had learned that number rather than just a certain flight distance. We, after the bees had been trained, produced contradictions between the correct number of landmarks and the learned distance. And if we increased the number of landmarks over the same distance, the bees landed earlier at an earlier distance from the hive than they would otherwise have during training. And if we reduced the number of landmarks over the same distance, they overshot their target and flew further. So they were indeed in that experiment guided by the number of landmarks. Since, since you uh, just mentioned the term shopper, for those who haven't yet had a chance to read the book, the analogies really struck home because who's going to think of a bee as a good shopper or more succinctly as a traveling salesman. So those analogies really make you understand. Yeah, explain the traveling salesman because no one's gonna know that until they read the book. There's nobody. Yes, so I'd already mentioned that bees have to learn about the flowers where they find nectar, but often the rewards in flowers are minute. The, 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 the rewards are tiny, tiny droplets of nectar. And indeed that's deliberately so in a sense because flowers want to keep bees moving because they want the bees to transport pollen between uh, flowers of the same species. So rewarding bees too richly would mean they could fill up at one flower without then transporting any pollen to other flowers and fly straight back to the hive. So that means that bees to fill their little stomach once typically have to visit multiple, often several dozen flowers. And because these are distributed in space, a challenge is to minimize the travel route and minimize travel expenditure and, and time while maximizing the rewards. And that is in a sense similar to a problem from the human realm the traveling salesman problem, which is, I guess, as the name suggests, the challenge that you're facing when you need to link a number of cities by car during the day. So let's say you're um, a sales representative for a publishing company, then you might want to visit, let's say, 10 bookstores in New York State and, um, and um, talk to the the shopkeepers about interesting new books. 
And you need to link these 10 cities in a manner that is not random, in a manner that um, is efficient in terms of finding the shortest route. And there are, of course, a very large number of linking 10 locations. So doing this by computer is, is not a trivial computational problem, yet it is actually one that animals, including bees, that need to visit a number of different locations um, every day need to solve. And so we basically ask, can bees solve simple versions of the traveling salesman problem by giving them arrays of a few feeding stations, five, for example, and see if they could find the most efficient route between these locations. And, the, go ahead. And the, the challenge, in a sense, is even more tough than for a human because, of course, bees are not given a map to start with. They can't um, spread out a map in front of themselves and, and look where the cities are, but they have to discover the locations in the first place without any kind of map or sat-nav. One thing I thought is that in the Darwinian sense, because you talk about how difficult it is and how many of these bees don't aren't up to the task, wouldn't you, and I'm sure you've studied this uh, in detail, wouldn't you have, wouldn't a layman think that the ones who are weak would have been selected out um, and the only ones remaining would be those who had the skills to accomplish the tasks that they have to do on an everyday basis during their very short lifespan? You would indeed imagine that there has been selection pressure to be good at such problems. Um, but perhaps just being good enough at solving them at a close to optimal fashion is, is uh, sufficient to scrape by. So you're right, there is typically variation between individuals in solving such tasks. Some are highly efficient and solve them within just a few iterations of uh, exploring where the locations are and find an optimal route whereas others take a relatively long time and some make repeated errors and so on. There is, however, often a trade-off between doing something well that you've already learned and exploring new solutions. So if, for example, we've trained uh, or the bee has trained itself to find some optimal route between five locations, and then we diagnose an error because suddenly it, the bee does, even though it's already gone, gone through the circuit multiple times, we know she can do it. Suddenly she changes the sequence or she goes exploring outside the array of flowers and, um, and does something novel. Now in an experimenter's mindset that might look like an error, that might looked like the bees made a mistake, especially if that um, iteration or new exploration is not rewarded with some new discovery. But nonetheless, of course, in the natural world, things always change. And so in addition to continuing doing what you can already do well, in this case, to solve this uh, root optimization problem and then just stick with one solution, it's always good to explore, to vary what you're doing and to find if there aren't perhaps newly emerged flower patches in this case that might also be worth visiting and incorporating into the circuit. So there might be some trade-off between just doing something repeatedly that you've learned to saturation, you can't improve on it, and on the other hand, trying novel solutions, trying to find out if there aren't other flower patches as well that might be worth exploring and incorporating into a route like that. Not to put words in your mouth, but what you've been saying so far sounds like you're dealing with an individual. Many people, including me, assume, perhaps wrongly, that a hive is collective. And to construct hexagonal cells with such exactitude can't be accomplished by a single individual. And there has to be this mutual co cooperation. And when the bee goes back, and as you say, 
for want of a better term, I use hands, they, they gather together and somehow because of this togetherness, they are able each and in a group to understand exactly where those best flowers are. And even if those best flowers won't be the best flowers next week. So how the heck do they do that then? So you're right, there are both individual problem solving strategies as well as social ones in, in the social bees, such as the honeybees. Um, you're also right in saying that at least in honeybees, something like the construction of these impressively regular hexagonal honeycombs needs multiple bees. There are some species of wasps that build hexagonal cells not from from wax, but from paper, and they start as a single individual. So it is technically possible for an insect to do that, but in honeybees, it's always a collective effort. So in honeybees, there is a very intricate interfacing between individual knowledge acquisition and social forms of information exchange. And there is a remarkable communication system in the honeybee called the honeybee dance, where essentially a successful forager that has located a good flower patch or a tree two kilometers, let's say, south of the hive, can come back to the colony and tell other bees using a kind of symbolic code where the food is without guiding them there, without flying together with uninformed individuals, but by simply giving them the information inside the darkness of the hive. And moreover, it's not just dark in there, they're also doing this on a, the vertical surface of the honeycomb. Um, they can't see each other. So the, the, the way this works in, in very coarse grained terms is that there is a repetitive motor display, a particular way in which the bee, the informed individual moves over the comb. And in the repetition of this pattern is the information about the direction and the distance of the food source. Oh. And... Oh, so what I was gonna say was, in your talks, you have emphasized this the fact that this is a brain mind the size of a pinhead and you also state that the neurons that they have are simply a fraction of the neurons that we possess but you seem to imply that the connections are immense perhaps i'm misinterpreting that but is it those connections i mean if if their brain mind was enlarged to the size of ours with they would rule the universe without a doubt. And yet somehow you state again, and it sounds like admiration almost in your talks, that they're able to accomplish this with so much less computation, seemingly computational power. Yes and no. So there is a lot of computational power undoubtedly in an insect brain. So if you look at the overall size, then one might be misguided to think that there can't be much going on, of course, in an insect brain. Um, it is indeed basically a cubic millimeter, and there are only about a million nerve cells in a bee's brain, whereas in a human brain, there are 85 billion. So in addition to be a lot larger in terms of volume or mass, there are also a lot um, more individual um, computational units, if you wish, in a human brain. Now, first of all, this difference in size is something that, of course, we find across the animal kingdom that simply the larger the animal, the bigger the brain. That does not necessarily always come with more intelligence. There are larger brained animals than the human animal. So there are blue whales, elephants that have larger brains than we do, and they're not necessarily smarter for that reason. And it's important to consider therefore that brains are scaled to some extent with body size, 
and larger animals need bigger brains in part because um, their, their nerve cells have to be bigger and the cables have to be bigger in larger animals. And that's because the speed at which nerve signals are conducted through neural cables, the axons, depends on the diameter. It is not like in an electrical cable where everything travels with the speed of light, but in nerve cells, the larger the cell and the larger the, 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 the neural cables, the faster the signal travels. So in larger brains, everything needs to be scaled up. Otherwise you'd be thinking very slowly and you'd be very slow at giving any commands to your hands and feet and so on. So for that reason alone, larger animals need larger brains. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, another analogy would be the fact that now we're developing quantum computers, which are able to function as well or much better than larger computers because they're basically doing ones and zeros in, uh, in spaces that are coming close to the Planck constant. And so that might be a good analogy as well, at least in my mind, it appears that it is. Um, so, so to come back to yeah, okay, the go ahead, sorry. Every, everything is very elegantly miniaturized. So nerve cells are much, much smaller, but not at all less complex than are those in a human brain. So if you look at the branching structure of the, the neural cables attached to any one nerve cells, these branching patterns can be as intricate as a fully grown oak tree, but very, very much um, miniaturized, of course. But each individual nerve cells, cell of these one million or so cells that a bee has might make up to 10,000 connection points with other nerve cells. And each of these connection points, the synapses is, is at least potentially plastic and can respond to experience by changing the transmission efficiency. And so the wiring diagram of such a bee brain, while of course it's less complex without a doubt than a human one, is still by far too complex for us to understand comprehensively. Now the reason why we and my colleagues are interested, or one reason we're interested in insect brains is that at least the dream of understanding any brain comprehensively seems closer within reach in something like an insect brain, which has relatively limited neural numbers and connection points than the human brain. But we're still a long way off even that dream goal of understanding the bee brain comprehensively, because while it's small, while they're relatively low numbers of neurons compared to animals like us, the, the complexity of the wiring and the functionality and plasticity is, is still very, very large to understand in a sort of full computational comprehensive manner. You know, if you take, playing devil's advocate, if you take starting with the title, which people might take issue with, then when you drill down to the fact that you're actually saying, and these are your words, they were talking about personalities, recognition of human faces, emotions, counting, using tools, problem solving, even not, notwithstanding what you're saying about the complexity, it's a quantum leap, not to use quantum again, it's a quantum leap from the ability to find a flower, know when it's going to fade, uh, know when it's already been uh, plundered, it's a, it's a giant leap to the fact that they can take a look at you and I and say, oh yeah, that's Lars, that's Sam. Yeah, so I mean, the, the face recognition is still a relatively simple experiment actually, um, because it capitalizes on the bee's ability to associate visual patterns as they find in flowers to uh, rewards. So that's how we do most of our experiments is that we give the bees a little sugar reward if she's found the correct thing, whatever that is. And so in this particular experiment, we um, 
had a little landing platform for a bee in front of an, a black and white image of a human face. And once she had learned to, to go to that platform, we then confronted it with a test, which is sort of a bit similar, like, like say you're a crime witness and ask to identify a suspect from a range of other individuals. The bee is then given a choice of different faces, all shuffled in spatial positions. And she's asked, can you find the right one? And they can do that. They can do that just fine and locate the individual image. But this is still a kind of um, derived version of recognizing a flower, except it's a very strange flower in that case um, with, with the, the image of a human face. So the, the key question is for asking the, whether there is a mind, whether there is a mental representation of the kinds of shapes that come in visual patterns. And one way of going about that question in um, tests of animal intelligence is, for example, to ask whether the, the a learned shape is accessible from multiple sensory modalities, from different senses. And so we did to ask that question, which goes beyond just recognizing a pattern. Um, we uh, trained bees to recognize either balls or to, to, to discriminate balls from cubes or cubes from balls, depending on which group each bee um, was in. So these were three dimensional shapes that during training they could only see, not touch. And we then asked after the bees had learned to land on a um, transparent screen over these shapes, which I couldn't touch to see. We then asked, could they recognize the same shapes by touch alone in complete darkness? And so these bees were not trained further to recognize the same things in darkness. We asked if they could spontaneously, just by touching, identify the correct shapes. So it's a little bit like the popular or used to be popular birthday, kids' birthday party um, game where you reach into a bag with, while you're blindfolded and you have to identify a certain object just by feeling it to pick a key from a screwdriver or whatever. And so the idea is that you, you have recourse to a mental representation that allows you to recognize the correct shape. And that's what we did. And indeed the bees that had been trained to identify round things just by seeing them could also find them in complete darkness by touching them and vice versa. In, and we uh, could also train the bees in darkness so they could only feel but not see things and then test them visually to see whether they could identify the right shapes. And that's oh, the kind of experiment where, sorry, Sorry, in your explanation, you're talking a lot about vision, and I think for the layperson and the and your reader, well, first of all, the illustrations and photographs in the book are extremely helpful and well done, and you. Uh, you know, for me, the idea of this compound eye, whether it's a fruit fly or whether it's the bee, when you have those photographs, even on the cover of the book, of this eye, we realize innately that this eye is nothing like our eye, and perhaps some explication of the eye itself. You know, we have to drill down here, but only to a certain extent. You know, I can't get to every, and we can't get to every body part. But with the eye, that's the most fascinating part, at least to me, and I think to most people, uh, with regarding um, the acuity that you're discussing. Yes, so I think it's interesting to contemplate that the world we see is not necessarily the real or that there is not a veridical representation in our perception of the world around us. And that is illustrated very well by the fact that other animals, including bees, see the world completely differently to the way we do. And the first way in which that is apparent, as you say, is the optics of the eye. The bees have a so-called compound eye which is made up of lots of little individual lenses rather than just a single lens. Each of these lenses underneath has a structure with multiple different color receptor types underneath. 
and overall the image produced by all of these little lenses together is much more coarse pixeled than what we see. So in that sense, in just the quality of the image in terms of how much spatial detail can be resolved, the insect eye is um, perhaps a bit inferior to our own. But bees comp and other insects compensate for that number one by being able to process more information per unit time. So they see faster than we do. So what that means is, for example, that the conventional 50 or 60 hertz strip lights that um, still exist in many offices are basically stroboscopic for bees. So they can see them going off and on um, 50, 60 times per second, but also um, a, a conventional cinema show with um, 24 or so images per, per second would be kind of a slideshow for an insect. But also in addition to these differences in spatial and temporal resolution, that there are important differences in color perception. So bees can see ultraviolet light. That's a portion of the spectrum that's beyond the violet, which we cannot see, which gives us sunburn, but we can't see it. And that means that many patterns in flowers, for example, that for us are just, let's say, uniformly yellow, have two colors for bees, one part where the flower reflects both yellow and ultraviolet and another where it reflects, for example, only yellow. So where we see and might objectively think that there is, that's just a homo homogeneously yellow flower, there are actually two colors which bees, but we can't see. And in addition, Bees and other insects can also see polarized light. That means basically the direction in which light swings. So you might recall that light has wave properties and indeed bees can use the, this information of the direction of the light waves to reconstruct the position of the sun and in turn to use this, the sun's position as well as the polarization pattern as a compass cue for navigation to find out whether they're currently flying south or north, for example. So the entire perceptual system is very different. Their reality as they perceive it is very different. And that of course determines everything that is inside their little minds, the perceptual and sensory filters that um, control which parts of the environment can enter into the brain. It's interesting that early on you talk about discussions that we would have had in college years in our dorm rooms at three o'clock in the morning, you know, whether your red is the same red as my red. In essence, you say it doesn't really make that much difference because we just compare, is that stoplight red to you? And yes, it is. That doesn't necessarily equate with our perception of what the color is, but it does equate with the fact that we have some commonality with regard to our decision-making process based on the symbol of something. But artists from Gauguin to Monet are fascinated by color and sometimes drives them insane. So the question is uh, that I would have, is the purpose of color in flowers primarily um, a source of information for the bee? Indeed it is. So you could say that bees actually painted the terrestrial environment colorful because before the advent of insects being used as pollinators, as, as vectors or go-betweens for reproductive material between male and female flowers, everything would have been green, right? So all the vegetation was just green. We now, of course, also have fruits, which are another signaling package, but to, to um, fruit eating and seed dispersing animals. But the other parts of flowers that has become colorful is, uh, of plants that has become colorful is the flowers. And they are indeed only evolved as signals to bees and other pollinators, flies, hummingbirds, and beetles, and so on, to um, signal that, come here, I've got a reward for you. And, um, and that reward is exchanged for the services by the pollinators to transport pollen or plant sperm essentially to 
to other flowers. If that's in case, if that is indeed the truth, not truth, but the scientific um, definition of what color is actually for, then this is outside the parameters of your book. Why do we perceive it? And those artists that I mentioned perceive it or John Keats as beauty. Is, you, won't, you don't know the answer to this, but just your opinion. Well, I mean, the, the color vision system as it's evolved in us and other old world primates um, seems to be linked to frugivory. So if you compare us to um, many other mammals, we are unique in that in addition to blue and green receptors, we have red receptors that allow us to distinguish red and yellow and orange from green vegetation. And the thinking is that this capacity has, involved, has evolved in conjunction with the habit of eating fruits from trees or other plants. And if you take that viewpoint, then of course the, the link of fruits with nutrition and with sweetness could uh, very well induce positive emotional states that, that are linked to an environment being enjoyable over one that's arid and devoid of nutrition. And likewise, of course, um, in all human cultures, or all I'm aware of, flowers are cherished as ornaments for, for our homes, and they're, they're given in a romantic context and so on. And I am speculating here, because there's no way to prove this, but I suspect that that is because flowers are, are an indicator of a fertile landscape, that if you're a primordial human choosing where to settle, then these colorful objects like flowers and, um, and uh, fruits either signal nutrition directly in the form of fruits, or they, they signal at least a fertile habitat that's abundant in water and so on. It's nice um, that that explanation is not clinical. It's somewhat romantic, which is what I was looking for. Um, but to switch topics, but overall, it is part of your decades long career is what you've done recently. And, I, and in one of your lectures, I actually saw it, you know, putting the transponders, these tiny transponders on bees, and then having these radar dishes rotating to determine all kinds of things. I know readers will be interested in that because I had difficulty in believing that you could actually accomplish that task. Yes, so the idea is that bees navigation, of course, has fascinated researchers for over a century and the question of how they find their way from the hive to flowers and back. But we could only ever make observations of where they started their flights and where they landed, not what they did in between. And so the question of what bees do when searching for food, when they're exploring their environment, where do they go? What kind of um, landscape features do they seek out remained in the dark? And again, with respect to the question of whether there is a mental representation of their environment, just looking at the end point, start and end points of each flight is not that informative. But if you're asking the question of whether the bee has a kind of mental representation of its spatial environment, then tracing its entire spatial whereabouts through this technology, the, the harmonic radar becomes very, very useful. So the way this works just briefly is because we can't stick anything battery driven on a bee's back because she wouldn't be able to carry it is the device that we use is called a transponder. And it's a very tiny bit of piece of equipment that weighs only about a 10th of what a bee can carry when she's naturally foraging nectar. And it's called a transponder because it picks up um, 
a radio wave frequency from a radar dish that we send in the, into the environment. And the transponder sends back, bounces back, reflects a harmonic of that outbound frequency. So uh, it just doubles the frequency essentially. And we can then pick up the reflected signal with a separate uh, radar dish to tell from the delay um, how far the bee is and from the directionality where the radar signal is the strongest, its, um, its direction. And that allows us to track bees throughout their entire lifetimes. And so in this way to find out how they build up a representation of their environment around them. Switch and in topics. the book, I was going to say to switch top. Well, if you're going to go ahead, because if you're talking about in the book, that directs the reader. So go ahead with that. Yeah. So in one observation of one individual whose CV, so to speak, we followed over her entire foraging career, it started out by her exploring her environment for a few hours. And then the next day, she finds a foraging patch that um, she then exploits for about a week. And then after um, some um, days of inclement weather, that bee flies out to that familiar patch. And then suddenly during such an outbound flight appears to change her mind. That is, she flies in a different direction, not to the patch to which she had started, but to another flower patch that she had only visited or explored once 10 days earlier on her very first flight ever without retrieving her steps, so to speak, back to the hive, but flying directly to that second destination. And this kind of observation, again, appears to us that there is more than just learning a route and then following it robotically, but that there is a kind of possibility to flexibly access distant memories, retrieve them, and then fly a shortcut directly to a destination that's familiar from the distant path, past, but without following a familiar path, just by computing a direct route to, to that new destination. And it's this sort of data that I think we need more of to find out how a bee builds up a kind of mental representation of the environment around it by following their entire careers using this kind of radar technology. If that's the case, once again, we're talking about the individual and the life, the short life of the individual that you're tracking. That's kind of like, and then when the, the bee goes back, it's kind of like the society of mind. But what we haven't touched upon is the culture and the division of labor in the hive, the drones, the workers, and of course, the queen. So that's completely different than what we've been speaking of. That's a different, it's a, it's a culture, is it not? Well, I guess we have to distinguish between things that could be considered to be largely innate, largely determined by genes, and things that could have been acquired via uh, a culture-like process. And I think traditionally, I think we view most of the, the social accomplishments of a hive as a whole as, as hereditary, as, as hardwired and uh, determined genetically, including the construction of honeycomb, including the, the communication system that I had mentioned earlier, and also the, the uh, intricate division of labor into guard bees and wax comb constructing bees and forager bees and undertaker bees that uh, remove corpses and so on. These are all um, individual labor specializations that you find in a honeybee colony. And by and large, the, the historical thinking is that all of this was required not by individual innovation and then um, subsequent elaboration, but instead by evolutionary trial and error processes through mutation um, and subsequent fixation. And I think that's probably still the correct view for 
many aspects of uh, social insect organization, but it's also becoming increasingly plausible that at least at some point in the distant past, cultural processes might also have played a role. And why am I saying that? We, we have observed that bees can um, learn certain techniques of object manipulation, not just by themselves, but also by observing each other. So to give you a few examples, we tested bees on a, on an, a kind of intelligence test that is traditionally, was traditionally used in primates and dolphins and um, other sort of conventional icons of animal intelligence. The, the string pulling task where the, the animal has to pull on a rope or a string to retrieve a food item that's otherwise out of reach. And in our case, we had a, an artificial flower presented under a plexiglass screen and that um, flower contained some nectar. And the bees in this case had to had to pull on a string protruding from underneath the plexiglass screen to get access to the reward. They could learn that just fine, but not only that, once you had seeded a colony with a single individual that mastered the technique, the technique would subsequently spread through the entire colony, like a social media meme can be monitored to spread from or between individuals in a human population. And so the, the learning capacity to innovate something and for that innovation to subsequently spread through a population um, of bees, the learning capacity is there. So the, the, it, the key ingredient for a culture-like process is plausible. It, it, it's possible that it is ex in existence in in bees and other social insects, and therefore the, the possibility that at least at some point in the distant past, something like the construction of regular honeycomb or aspects of the division of labor or indeed the communication system, the plausibility that it, at its early evolutionary roots, something like this might have been spreading just by copying. And then in later generations have been nailed down, so to speak, into the genome, it's at least a possibility. We don't know this, but um, it is possible, at least from what we now know about the learning um, capacities in bees, that such processes indeed played a role at some point in um, the evolution of the division of labor and also the building capacities of bees. I don't mean this frivolously, but is there time in this short lifespan for leisure, recreation, play, not only just for that purpose, but like lion cubs playing and essentially learning how to fight later on in their life? Is that possible? It is possible. Um, and indeed, one of my PhD students, Samadhi Galpayage, is in the process of publishing a paper about play-like behavior in bumblebees. Now, our laboratory bumblebees are, um, are relatively privileged in that they have more spare time than, than do bees in the wild, who are, of course, under the rigors of natural selection constantly. And indeed, it appears that um, her bees seem to engage with ball rolling in a manner that indicates a form of, of enjoyment without there being actually any other reward being present. That's fascinating. Well, in conclusion, I guess, and in your lectures, you'll say that, unless I've got it wrong, that 25% of what humans consume is basically derived from pollination and cross-pollination. And an issue that must be very, well, is very close to your heart is what we are doing to our world, both you know, in climate change and the destruction of species. And now people are finally becoming aware of, not selflessly, but they're becoming aware selfishly of what will happen if the creatures you've been studying for a good portion of your life disappear. How do we stop that? And are you optimistic? Are you cautiously optimistic? Are you pessimistic about the next couple of decades, not only with the world in general, but with your topic? 
Yeah, I think um, people are becoming increasingly aware that we need bees um, to pollinate our crops and our wildflowers, um, our garden flowers and so on. So they realize that that's one type of insect that we need to conserve because otherwise we're, we're in trouble. Um, whether we're taking the right steps is another question. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement. So the, the widely practiced uh, remedy of celebrities and some um, greenwashing companies to put up a few honeybee hives is not going to fix the problem, but, but is going to aggravate it because these are domesticated animals anyway that are not under threat and um, that actually compete with those wild pollinators that are already under threat. Um, so I think there is a growing awareness that, that um, pollinating insects, including bees, are useful, but the, um, the wide-scale habitat destruction through industrialized agriculture, the thick coating of entire landscapes in pesticides, and so on are not boding well for the future of pollinators and climate change, of course, adds to all of these problems. Yet I think not everything is doom and gloom. I think one of the nice things about pollinator conservation is that everyone can contribute a little bit. And that is that, um, that as opposed to sort of iconic models of, of um, animal conservation, Siberian tigers and so on, which are somewhere far away when you can perhaps donate some money, but you can't personally do something. To the extent that you yourself have any bit of green space, a garden or just uh, even a few flower boxes in front of windows, you can provide bees with crucial resources by planting native flowers that are rich in nectar and and pollen and which can be used by bees where other natural flowers are perhaps less sparse. In addition, um, if you do have a garden, then don't replace your, your lawn with a plastic lawn. That I guess is about the most disastrous step that you could take, but instead consider letting your lawn run a little wild and let those wild, wild flowers grow. Don't um, cut them every weekend, um, but let them grow. Leave a bit of a mess in your garden to, um, to allow nesting opportunities for wild bees and so on. So in addition to the, the, um, the utility need um, that, um, that the, the argument that we need bees, therefore we should conserve them. I'm hoping also that the increasing likelihood that bees are to some extent sentient, that they're capable of enjoying a good environment and suffering from an adverse environment will also be conducive to people making more efforts to, to um, provide bees with the right resources for finding food as well as for finding nesting space. Well, to can conclude then, Professor, what I would say would be, to use my own analogy, is when I put this book on my front table, and because the cover is so aesthetically pleasing and informational, I think that the analog would be that people will be attracted to it because of its beauty and because they recognize that there's a certain utilitarian availability there. So maybe in some sense, we are like your uh, subjects. So thanks so much, Professor Doc Dr. Lars Chitka, author of The Mind of a Bee, which is just being released. Um, when this is posted, it'll be just uh, released a week, be a week before July 26. So thanks again for being here with us. I really have enjoyed our talk. All right, you're welcome. I enjoyed it very much as well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.